So how do we sustain an undefeated mind? So first of all, okay, how does our mind get defeated? Does this look familiar to, to you? When we have thoughts that are self-defeating, that I can't do something before we even try, and that I'm not worthy, that I always have to be perfect, I mustn't make mistakes, I'm not good enough, and sometimes we get into the state of mind, nobody loves me. And we get this sense of disappointment with life, disappointment with people around us. Uh, we resent things not going the way we want, and even a sense of shame. So when does this all start? And it's probably not just now, but even when we're younger. How do we respond to situations when they don't go right? So I'm going to move over there because I want to share with you some stories. So when I was uh, a young teen, well, actually wasn't that young anymore, about 18, and I went to the U.S. for my uh, education in Iowa. Um, first of all, when I went to the U.S., I thought I was going to go to a country where there is no discrimination. That was true freedom. Uh, I, I can, went from Malaysia to, to the U.S. And admittedly, what I really experienced was actually something quite different. For the first time in my life, I really felt discriminated against. Now, you might be surprised because in Malaysia, it is natural for us to be discriminated. <laughs> but then I grew up knowing I was going to be discriminated. But when I went to the US, I had a totally different ex uh, expectation that it was equality. But it wasn't that way. And so it really hit me very badly. I was so hurt when my uh, roommate, who was uh, from Chicago, said to me, you really should go back to your country. Because I didn't smoke, I didn't drink, and I didn't go to fraternity parties. Why? Because I had to work hard, because I know my parents were spending a lot of money to send me there, um, and I had to uh, actually take a job uh, in case my dad had a heart attack and couldn't afford to keep me there, because his health wasn't good. So it really hurt uh, at that time. And I knew that I had to understand that they didn't see me as someone like them. And to forgive them. And forgiveness is really what helped me to be able to move forward. Because if not, I would be living with resentment. I would be angry. And I would even have a terrible experience continuing on in the university. Now, another incident I'd like to share with you was when I took up the job at the uh, dormitory cafeteria. And it was a breakfast shift. Most people don't want to do breakfast shift because you have to wake up very early and you have to be there by 6.15 because the students will be waking up and coming into the cafeteria by 6.30, around there. So the first time I went there, the um, supervisor was a full-timer and she was probably like, she looked 65 to me at that time. But maybe when we're 18, everybody looks 65. <laughs> maybe now I look 65 to my students. <laughs> so she said, do you know how to serve the toast? And I thought, I looked at her, like, oh, is it so complicated to serve toast? And she said, okay, let me teach you. I said, okay. She says, well, they ask the student when they come in, do you want it with butter or not with butter? I said, okay. And she says, if it's with butter, then you... Pick up, pick it up, and she picked up the plate. And take the brush, and brush the butter on it, and then you serve it. I said, okay, I can do that. <laughs> so I was standing there waiting patiently, and then a student walked up, and I think he was half asleep anyway. I said, would you like it buttered or not buttered? He said, butter please. I said, okay. So I picked up the plate and I took the brush and I buttered the plate. <laughs> and I put the toast on it and I gave it to him. <laughs> and this went on for quite a few <laughs> times. 
and the student never said anything. <laughs> I thought, these Americans are really weird. <laughs> <laughs> they want the butter on the plate. <laughs> so I just did it as, as I was told until somebody walked up to me and said, you're supposed to butter the toast. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, and I started to laugh. <laughs> and thankfully I laughed because I could have felt really ashamed of myself. <laughs> and then I realized that, you know what, laughter is a really good medicine <laughs> because it really... <clears throat> puts a, a humorous side to, you know, sometimes we can do things that are really stupid. But actually, I thought the way she taught me was pretty stupid. <laughs> because she never said, pick up the toe, she just says, pick it up. <laughs> and she picked up the plate. I thought, well, if that's how the Americans want to eat it, it's fine with me. <laughs> so... <laughs> If you went for a diagnosis, what would you be tested for? <laughs> would you be tested positive or for being too negative? <laughs> or you're being tested positive for being too negative? <laughs> and we have a choice on how we want to look at life because we often think that in life we always have to make the right decisions. And having now lived 55 years of my life, I realized that the decision we make is the best at that point in time. And we can't really, or we couldn't really have made a different decision. So every decision is right at that time. And sometimes people spend so much time worrying about whether it was the right decision. Now, I've been married twice, and I've failed twice. Does that make me a failure? Come on, say it. <laughs> I have learned so much that I'm a really good marriage counselor now. <laughs> because I know all the things that could go wrong with a marriage. <laughs> so when I sit in a wedding dinner, I no longer believe all this. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about, all those speeches? I have now found the better part of me. <laughs> that now my life is so complete. Talk to them a few years later <laughs> and ask if that's the same answer they give you. <laughs> so I was even a solemnizer for marriages. And I said to my, the couples before they marry, can you please memorize the vow? Because honestly, when I said yes, I didn't know what I was saying yes to. <laughs> So I figured if they had to memorize it, at least they would probably be better at remembering how to live up to them. But it is a tall order in this today's time. Because in the old days, why did marriage last? Exactly, because the women had no choice. So they just remember. Those of you asking why women got such long memory. <laughs> And it was because we didn't have financial independence. And that was the case with my mother, who stayed on in the marriage despite the fact that my father had so many other women in his life. And I then remember telling myself that I would never want to put myself in that position to be dependent on a man. So all my life since I left university, I have never allowed myself to be financially dependent on a man. And it's not a choice I have. So it's nothing to do with right choice, wrong choice. It's because of the circumstances and the conditioning that has happened in my life. So whatever has happened to you in your life, it is precisely because of the circumstances you were in and the conditioning. And what mindfulness has done for me is to be aware of that conditioning. That if I wish to change it now, I have the ability to switch out of that thought and apply a new one. <laughs>